né? Vamos checar o YouTube. Hello, morning. Hi, uh, hi, Jane. Yes. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Very good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm yeah. doing fine. <laughs> yeah. What time is it there now? Uh, it's eight fifty-one. Oh, eight fifty-one. Okay, yeah, ten minutes to nine. Okay. Yes, exactly. Oh, how's yeah. everything there? Is a uh, is a uh, pandemic okay there, or is it affecting? Um, yeah, so it it was okay until a few weeks ago, but then um, it's uh, the numbers started increasing again. So now um, it's up to us whether to go to the office or not. Um, oh, and I, so optional. I'm. It's it's optional, uh, but I'm pregnant. So um, uh, from Jamie Young, congratulations! Yes. Thank when, you. When, is, when are you due? January. January. January, wow. yes. And uh, because of that, I take it a bit more seriously. And um, so I go to yeah. work once a week, sometimes twice a week. And then the rest, I'm at home. Yeah. Uh, My maternity leave starts next week, actually. Nice. Uh, how long is the maternity leave there, usually? Um, so it's usually first uh, six weeks before the... Uh, before the birth but in my case I'm starting four weeks before because I still had to do some some things before leaving and then um, eight weeks after the birth so in total it's a bit more than three months I see, I see. so is it your uh, first child or 
First, yes. Wow, wow. congratulations. <laughs> yes, thank you. I have a Do daughter. Have... Okay. I have a daughter. Uh, she's like, uh, like in college now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, you're just starting, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But it's, it's exciting, a... you know, adventure too. Yes, yes. I, I heard from a lot of people that it's a life-changing experience. <laughs> Yeah, that's obviously true. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you'll see. <Yes. laughs> Especially for mother. Yeah, a lot of mm. work. But it, I think it'll be re rewarding, you know, especially to mothers. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How is Damyong doing? Uh, is, is he doing okay? He is, he is doing quite well. Yes, we um, actually we collaborated with one of your students for CVPR, Jung Wu. Jung Wu. Jung Wu. Yeah, thanks and, for uh, like, you know, uh, helping the students. You know, yes, write. yes. Yeah. yeah, of course, I, I enjoyed it, actually. He's quite good. And mm -hmm. uh, Jae Myung had one paper uh, from before. He started his PhD oh, yeah. with you again. <laughs> so uh, this, this we wrapped up. And now he is starting a new project. I see. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think he's going to continue working on uh, explainable AI, I guess? Yes, yes, in, in some form, yes. Um, <clears throat> we don't, so at the moment we are kind of inclining more towards <clears throat> compositionality and um, image retrieval tasks. Mm -hmm. um, nice. It's like a follow-up of one of our previous projects. This will make things easier for me because I will be absent for a while. And in the meantime, the postdoc who was leading the other project is going to help with uh, Jamie's supervision. Are you yeah. uh, still uh, kind of uh, involved with the neighbor labs or is it? Um, so the uh, Song Jun is going to start in April mm -hmm. and uh, after that, I, I'm, I don't know anything about the establishment of the Naval Lab here yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it is going to be together with Song Jun's starting. Uh, I'm not involved personally, but I am collaborating in general. We are, um, we are also organizing a New Europe's workshop together. Okay. Yes, yes. And I did my PhD in, in, in Ria in France and Xerox Research Center Europe. And that uh, institute became Naval Labs Europe. I so I know I, quite- They have a location in Grenoble. Uh, in Grenoble, exactly. Yes. So I was in that building half time. Oh, oh okay. Yes, yeah, so I know a lot of people in the Naval Labs Europe. So you studied in France for PhD. Does that mean you yes. can speak French also or? Ah, just a little bit, very small. <laughs> How about German? <laughs> oh, German? German? My German is better. Ah. Um, it's conversational. I can't um, give a lecture, not good enough, uh, that much, but speaking with people outside, friends, it's, it's okay there now. My husband is German. This, this is helpful. <laughs> oh, okay, that must be helpful. <laughs> yeah. You guys speak in English or in German? Yes, we speak in English. Yeah, he's helping me when I have questions. Okay, well, that's yeah. an excellent tutor, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I gave you a permission to share a screen. Could you maybe uh, uh, yeah. start yes. testing your uh, presentation before I uh, introduce you? Can you see my screen? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I can see. And when I move, it moves. Okay, yeah, it's moving. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so this is being simulcast to YouTube and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, there'll, there'll be, uh, uh, which mode do you prefer? Do you want to like interactive, make it interactive or do you want to get questions at the um, end? Either way is fine for me. Um, I have a, about 45 minutes for the presentation. Okay. 
Yeah. So maybe okay. afterwards you 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 can take some questions. I maybe guess. yeah to to regulate the time better, but um, yes. if there if, yes. if there is any question that you know is really important to understand the rest of the talk, then it's okay. I can take a couple of those. Yeah, the the audience is uh, like typically uh, graduate students uh, who are actually uh, specializing in like AI deep learning. So I guess they are okay. you can you can consider them like quite experienced. Mm -hmm. um, so you can maybe raise the level of your uh, technical difficulty if you want to, but you know, it, it really uh, okay. is your call. Okay. And, I made a broad overview of my research. Oh, yeah, I don't go too much into detail. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, uh, actually Korean students tends to be a bit shy so they may ask questions on the chat board. So you may want oh. to open up the chat board, you know, to see if there's a... Uh, um, I don't question. know I, if I can do it. Or I can relay that question. Screen. Okay, yeah. Okay. So why don't I just start uh, by uh, introducing you? Yeah. Okay, shall we start? Okay, um, let me see. Okay, let me uh, introduce uh, Professor Jainab uh, Akata. She's a, a professor of computer science at University of Tübingen, and she's also a senior researcher at Max Planck Institute, which is, I guess, a famous place. And she uh, finished her PhD at Indria uh, in France in 2014. And she had a lot of experience. She worked at uh, Max Planck, also at the uh, University of California, Berkeley with, uh, uh, I guess, uh, famous professor Trevor Darrell. Uh, and also he, uh, I mean, she uh, worked at the University of Amsterdam uh, with Professor Maxwell. And by the way, she, uh, he gave a talk uh, uh, about three weeks ago here at the same colloquium. Yes, I heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he mentioned that uh, he knows you very well. <laughs> OK. OK, and, yeah, and Professor Akata received many awards, uh, including uh, Rees Meitner Award, uh, Werner von Siemens Ring Young Scientist Honor and ERC Starting Grant and DAGM German Pattern Recognition Award in 2021. And her main research interests are uh, multimodal learning and explainable AI. Um, maybe without further ado, uh, let us welcome Professor Dana Bakata. Yeah, thank you. Ahead. Thank you for the wonderful in introduction and thank you for inviting me for this uh, colloquium. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I have prepared a talk that walks through my uh, as much as possible my entire research so I don't go too much into details. Mm -hmm. If in, in case um, any of you are interested in learning more about them, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, so my talk today is about visual recognition with minimal supervision and explainability. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will start with visual recognition with minimal supervision. This is related to zero shot learning, low shot learning. And uh, we use some form of side information like language to enable that. And then I will talk about how we generate textual and visual explanations for visual recognition. So the domain of my research is mostly computer vision, and, um, but I'm interested in machine learning models applied to computer vision and together with natural language. And then I will summarize and talk about some future works. Let's start with visual recognition with minimal supervision. When we look at uh, large scale data sets like ImageNet, we see that they have a long tail distribution, uh, which means that some of the classes like cars 
they have a lot of examples, but we have uh, rarely those classes. Most of the classes are represented with only a few examples. And uh, in this example, this is an uh, in, in ImageNet, a class called Spanish Firefly, and it has only three examples. And this is because these objects are uh, very rarely found in the nature. So capturing pictures of them is very difficult, but also naming them is very difficult because only field experts can recognize them. And it becomes a very costly process to find annotations for them. My research focuses on the tail of this distribution. When we don't have enough, uh, when we don't have the labels, we can use some form of side information like attributes. In this example, of course, we know these objects very well. Uh, just uh, as a simple example, I have chosen zebra and whale. And uh, our aim is to co uh, collect attributes that are visually discriminative properties of objects like black and white, has tail, lives on land, is small. And these properties are shared between different classes. And we would like to build a vectorial representation of, of every class. So um, <clears throat> some of these attributes are common, like has tail property is common for both classes, although the tails may look different. Then the vector will have the value one. And then some of these attributes are specific to one class. So the vector will have the value one for zebra and zero for whale. And some of these attributes are relative to each other. So we can also have uh, values between zero and one. Once we build this vectorial representation, now we can, uh, we can see that some uh, classes in an embedded space like this are going to be embedded close to each other. And some of them are further away and we will use this kind of visual similarity or, or semantic similarity in learning. So this multimodal embeddings framework is a me method that we had developed during my PhD, but it's a very simple method, but very effective. We uh, embed images in an image feature space and this feature space could be learned with a deep neural network like ResNet and this space is frozen. And then we embed labels in a class attribute space the way I described before, zeros or ones or co 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 um, continuous values. And then this space is also frozen. Now we have to find the compatibility between these two spaces such that um, images from the same class are embedded close to each other and close to its own attribute vector and further away from all of the other classes. And we do this, we learn this uh, uh, W parameters using certain classes um, because in the zero shot learning um, uh, setup, we don't have access to images of some classes. So during training, we use images of certain classes. We learn a compatibility function. And then at test time, we receive another image from a completely different class. We embed it in the image feature space we project it onto the class attribute space and check how close it is to any of the attribute vectors. And if we have learned the meaning of every attribute in a multimodal way, then this uh, image is going to be embedded close to its own attribute vector. And although this attribute vector has not been seen before. Um, there are many data sets for Zero shot learning. The, the, these two ones I picked, they are uh, two of the most important benchmark data sets. They come with attributes. Um, the animals with attributes data set has 50 classes. All the images of 40 classes are used for training and 10 for test. And we have 85 attributes. Caltech UCSD birds data set contains 200 classes. This is a much more fine grained data set. 150 of them are used for training and 50 for test. And because it's so fine grained, we need many more attributes because these objects look very similar to each other. Now, um, the accuracy is computed by per class accuracy because um, class uh, data sets could be imbalanced. Some of the classes may be very, very highly populated. To, um, uh, to remove the bias towards these classes, 
we evaluate it by computing the number of correctly classified samples in a class divided by the total number of samples in a class. We average them for all the classes, either for seen or unseen classes, and then we divide it by the number of classes. And then <coughs> for the generalized zero-shot learning, this means um, at test time, we are going to have images that could come from seen classes also, um, as well as unseen classes. This means the model needs to remember what it has learned before, and also it needs to generalize to new concepts. And to reflect that it's both uh, capable of doing both of the objectives, we measure also the harmonic mean. So the first line in this table is learning with class labels. This is a simple ResNet trained with softmax classifiers. And we can see that on, on the BIRDS data set, uh, the unseen class accuracy is zero because this um, model cannot generalize to unseen classes. It doesn't have the vocabulary and the harmonic mean is zero. Learning with attributes using multimodal embeddings gives us uh, these accuracies and the harmonic mean is like this. And we see that uh, there are some problems. First, the seen class accuracy drops a bit because now we want to generalize to unseen classes. And the unseen class accuracy is not that high. And uh, as a consequence, the harmonic mean is not that high either. And also and a third problem is we need attributes to be able to do that. And uh, there are many other uh, sources of side information that we could have used. So one, one alternative to attributes is free text. And this is much, easy, much more easy to obtain because we can ask users in Amazon Mechanical Turk, we can show them images like this and um, from fine-grained data sets. They don't need to know the label of these images. They don't need to know what type of bird this is, but they can describe it in this way. We ask them, in fact, to um, only talk about the bird and not the surrounding. We ask them not to talk about the activity the bird might, might be doing, but only the visual appearance. We ask them to uh, say at least three properties. Um, and we ask them to use at least 10 words in the sentences. And these are the kind of sentences that they have come up with. And these sentences turned out to be quite class specific, in fact. So there are many different ways to extract vectorial representations from these sentences. This is a paper from 2016 and that at that time transformers didn't exist. So one um, method that worked quite well for us was a hybrid between convolutional encoding and, 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 the, and an RNN, a sequential encoding. We took um, every letter in the, alpha, in the word uh, and the sentence we converted it into one hot vector, depending on the position of the letter in the alphabet, that position in the vector is one, the rest are zeros. And the, the sentence then becomes a matrix of zeros and ones on which we can do convolutions. And then we stacked an RNN on top of it and the hidden unit activations of this RNN gave us a vector. And this vector corresponds to this sentence. If we want to build a class specific representation, then again, there are many different ways to ag aggregate these sentences. But what we did was a very simple technique. Just we took the, um, the vectorial representation of this sentence and all the other sentences in the same class, and we averaged them. Now um, we can do, we can use um, uh, generative models to generate samples for the classes um, that for that for which we don't have any visual examples. We use the GAN framework for it. And um, so <laughs> the modifications we did to the plain GAN was um, instead of generating an image from the noise vector directly, we concatenated our sentence embedding. This could be sentence level or class level. Then we uh, generate a noisy image. And in the discriminator side, it is a conditional discriminator. And uh, it, it determines whether the 
um, the image is real or fake, but also whether the image content corresponds to sentence or not. And um, so after we trained this GAN um, with sentences and real images of seeing glasses, which are, we are allowed to do, we can now discard the discriminator. We use the frozen generator to uh, generate images of um, images of unseen classes using the sentences of unseen classes. And then after we generate that image, we can uh, um, train a, a ResNet now that, um, that uh, operates normally like um, with the softmax loss. Is it closely related to so-called conditional GAN? Yes, exactly. Yes. So this is uh, this was the first work that came out with a mm -hmm. sentence as a conditioning variable. Okay. Great. Yeah. And uh, the um, sentences give give us the flexibility to generate as many examples as we want. So, for example, blue bird with black beak generates this image. Red bird with black beak generates this image. And then these are the images that are interpolations between these two sentences. They may not correspond to something uh, semantic, but uh, it is a great uh, data augmentation um, uh, way, like way of doing data augmentation. Let's look at the results because this was our starting point. When we use only real data with multimodal embeddings framework, this is the numbers I showed you. And when we use generated images, we add them into the training set and we train a ResNet classifier, a ResNet with softmax classifier, then we get these numbers. Actually, this is not better than having no images. And then one must think about what, what went wrong here. Um, first, uh, maybe the capacity of the, of the network wasn't, uh, wasn't very good. And, certainly things can be done in that uh, dimension. But at the same time, if the aim is to do classification, we may not need to generate an image and then extract features from them. It's a very noisy process. Instead, we can take um, images, real images, we can uh, extract features from them, and then we can train a conditional GAN on the feature space. This way we don't need convolutions, we can use simple MLPs, and this makes the uh, generative model much more stable. This is what we did. So we trained the, uh, a, a, a conditional GAN that operated on the feature space. And we added those features in our training set. And that improved the results significantly, mainly because the unseen classes, uh, class results improved. And this is uh, because our sentences or attributes that we used as conditioning variables are very nicely, uh, they lie in a space that is separable. All the classes are represented in, uh, in uh, far away blobs. If we use um, embeddings like word to vec or more noisy embeddings, it doesn't work as well. So we need some um, a discriminative um, label embedding space for it. And then this is one, one more generative model. Um, it's um, based on VAE, it's a conditional model again. Uh, it's designed in such a way that also it operates on the feature level. We, we, take, we take an image, we extract features from it. We have an encoder decoder framework and there is a, a distribution that is learned in the middle. And then we have the same thing for sentences or, or attributes. It operates in the semantic vector level. At the moment, these two VAEs don't communicate. And the contribution of this paper was to make them communicate with two additional losses. We, uh, one of them is called distribution alignment loss. And we, the aim of it is to align these two distributions. So uh, the, uh, the samples that are sampled from these distributions should be close to each other. And then the other um, loss is ensures that the 
uh, latent embedding that is learned with the first VAE is good enough to um, reconstruct features of um, semantic features. And the embedding, the latent embedding learned with the semantic features is good enough to, um, to reconstruct image features. And then we can again uh, train this model using um, uh, embeddings of seen or Im seen images and seen uh, attributes and we fr uh, freeze the encoders and then we can use either of the encoders now as we don't have access to unseen uh, images we use unseen um, sentences and this time instead of um, reconstructing the features we can just sample from this learned distribution so we have um, lower dimensional embeddings as well and this improved results further. Maybe the uh, most natural way of thinking now is to combine the two generative models. So we have an, a, a hybrid model of a VAE and a GAN here. And uh, these two generative models share an, a dec decoder or a generator. And both of them are conditional. And um, during training, again, we use seen uh, images of seen classes and text of seen classes. And at test time, we use um, text of unseen classes and we generate features that we use for training the model. And that further improves results. Of course, as I mentioned, there are some uh, problems with attributes. And in fact, for fine-grained uh, data sets, the attributes can have incidental correlations. So for example, um, all the classes that have a um, yellow throat may have yellow bellies. And uh, the, then the embedding space that we learn is treats these two attributes as one attribute. And it is not possible to disentangle between them. And if we, at test time for an unseen image, if we have received an image that needs this disentanglement, then, uh, um, then this is the parts these are the images where the models fail. To improve that, we have proposed an attribute prototype network where we take um, uh, an image encoder and we try to learn prototypes for uh, every attribute group. And we have grouped the attributes according to their body parts. So we want to make sure that um, attributes that are um, in, so, that may be correlated, but that, that come from two different body parts uh, are, will have to fall into two different prototypes during the learning process. And then uh, um, we basically, um, we take the, the attribute prototype, we uh, learn an, um, an attention map for it. And then the, uh, the maximum value of this attention map becomes the, uh, the value of the attribute. And then we also have access to the ground truth attributes and we can compare the learned, the value of the learned attribute and the ground truth attribute and um, the difference we can like propagate through the network. And this uh, way of um, post-processing, so to say, helps to localize the attributes better. So, um, for example, for the, uh, for the breast and belly, the attributes are localized in the um, breast and belly region. The legs are localized in the correct region and, uh, and so on. Whereas the, uh, the base module without the prototypes, are, um, th they have a much spread out attention map. And then we have uh, noticed uh, situations like uh, for example, for the same attribute type stripes, some of the classes have these attributes as annotate, annotated, and these attributes are correctly localized. But some uh, classes don't have these attributes as annotated, like rat don't have, rats don't have stripes, killer whales don't have stripes, but still the model detects some stripes in some of the images, and we see that these images contain stripes-like structures. Um, this was interesting. This, this indicates that the model may have learned the, the semantic meaning of this attribute. 
coming back to the uh, results. So learning with attributes looks like this. Learning with attribute prototypes improved results significantly, but this is also because we have a fine-tuned network now. And then uh, I showed the results with generated features before. And um, if we use uh, the features that are learned by our attribute prototypes network to train a generative model, that further improves results. But this distance difference is not that high. Finally, very briefly, um, there are many other sources of side information. And this is one exploration we had. Um, on using DNA as side information. So um, these, uh, this information is available for all living beings. Of course, it's not possible to do this for uh, general object categories, but uh, for fine grain classification, when, um, when uh, the object's properties are very, um, very close to each other, then it may not be very easy even for experts to distinguish between them. Sometimes two birds um, look similar and uh, it's difficult to distinguish them. You need to listen to them to be able to, um, to differentiate. And when it is not possible, then we can use um, more fundamental data sources like DNA. And um, we have shown in this paper that extracting features from from certain parts of the DNA. Of course, this is not my specialty, but I have, I have learned that some parts of the DNA corresponds to um, um, physical properties of the objects. And these are very class discriminative. And we can use this sequence information and extract a one hot encoding like did, we did for sentences and then use a CNN model to learn a uh, lower dimensional embedding space and use that as side information when we do this multimodal mapping. This already works better than using word to vec embeddings. It doesn't work better than attributes, but for some cases, we don't have access to attributes. So then it becomes useful. Um, as a conclusion, we, um, we are, uh, I was talking about learning with attributes and learn a natural language. And this is required when labeled training data is not available. And it's a means for transferring knowledge from seen to unseen classes. We have seen results on generalized zero-shot learning. And also these side information can be used to generate features of unseen classes. And this is a good data augmentation mechanism. Um, now I would like to talk about, about um, explainability um, and for visual recognition. So um, we would like to um, generate sentences that uh, would help a user who may have partial observation about the environment to understand uh, what the concept is and to be able to Im improve her trust to the system. And the setup is as follows. A user looks at, at an image and asks a question, what type of bird is this? And then the model is capable of understanding the question and also looking at the image and making a classification decision. It says it's a cardinal and it doesn't stop at that, but it also says because it's a red bird with a red beak and a black face. So it talks about visually discriminative properties of this object. And this helps the user understand why this object was classified in this way. And then um, it's important for the user to be able to, uh, or for the user's trust, to be able to see where the model has looked at to come to a certain conclusion. So we would like these uh, phrases that are mentioned in the sentence to be grounded on the image. So if the model says red bird, then it needs to show us that where the red bird is. And then for explainability, uh, for classification problems like this, it's important that they are contrastive. So the user might ask, why not a vermilion flycatcher? And then the model needs to think about how a vermilion flycatcher looks like 
and then uh, determine the properties of this alternative class that are not visible in this image. So it's not a vermilion flycatcher because it doesn't have black wings. And if we can build neural networks that can argue about their own decisions in this way, then uh, we are, um, this is one step towards explainability. So how do we do that? We actually, it's a post-talk explanation technique where the, the decision maker and the explanation generator are kind of separated. We would like to uh, uh, use a state-of-the-art decision maker that will take an image, process it, give us an image feature and the class label, and then, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, LSTM in this case, or a language model is going to take this image feature and the class label as a conditioning variable to generate uh, sentences that uh, would reflect the content of both the image and the class label. And uh, the model might be generating a sentence like this. We are not sure yet uh, whether this sentence contains all of the visual properties that are visible in the image. So we take the sentence, we divide it into noun phrases, and we, uh, we use a um, grounding model that is trained on a different task because this data set doesn't have bounding boxes um, to determine the, um, the score between each bounding box and a um, noun phrase. And then we can do that for multiple generated sentences. And then we can rank these sentences based on how well every noun phrase corresponds to the uh, bounding box that they get as associated with. So the sentence score is the cumulative score of these noun phrase bounding box relations. And then we can say, okay, the first sentence score is higher, so this sentence is more relevant for the image. Um, some examples from the results. So the, uh, this, this is a because is a template. The red-winged blackbird is the sentence, uh, sorry, the label that is um, predicted, and the rest of the sentence is generated and it is the justification sentence. And this is a, a model, an, ab an ablation of this model that doesn't have the bounding box um, capability. And this model both has, uh, has improved this model in terms of showing where the model is looking at, but also uh, because it is forced to uh, ground these properties, it also talks about better properties like red spot on its wing bars is very important for this image, for this class. And we talked about contrastive explanations and this is one way of doing that. Uh, the model looks at this image and this image I'm showing you as an example. Um, and this image seems to be the image that is clo the closest to this image, according to visual similarity, that comes from another class. Um, so the class of this image is crested oaklet, and we've first had the generated sentence using the model that we have. And it is not a because is a template. This is the um, a class label of the closely related class because it doesn't have a long flat bill. And this property comes from um, the fact that this property is one of the properties that corresponds to this class. And this seems to be the property that has the lowest score, lowest matching score when we want to project it onto that image. This is how we decide. So it's not, uh, it's not a very uh, kind of smooth generation. It is full of templates, but still um, uh, it's interesting. It was interesting to see that this was another uh, possibility that this model could do. Um, we tried the same um, post-talk explanation model on other tasks, like um, for video processing and using a um, self-driving car engine, a decision maker that takes the, uh, 
that uh, outputs the course and the acceleration of the vehicle. That, uh, those become the conditioning variables that enter the language model, generate these sentences. And uh, instead of bounding boxes, this model has the, the driving engine gives us attention maps. And these are the sentences that are, the entire sentence is generated because we had also collected a data set that has grown through the explanations. So the car heads down the road because the traffic is moving at a steady pace. The first part of the sentence is about the um, decision and the rest is about the uh, explanation, about the justification. And we saw that uh, for these 30 to 40 second long videos, we have divided them into chunks of usually five seconds because the behavior of the car changes every five seconds or so. Uh, these short sentences are um, uh, quite uh, different. Uh, they have quite a bit of variety. And then another uh, interesting task when it comes to explainability and natural language is visual question answering. So the question could be like this, is this a healthy meal for this image? The answer is no. The textual justification says it's because it's a hot dog with a lot of toppings and it needs to be, those properties need to be pointed onto, onto the image. For an alternative decision and an alternative image, we have an alternative justification sentence. And it points to the vegetables on the table. Um, so one more um, topic that I would like to touch um, that is related to explainability is how can we um, reach transparency of the model. So, so far we have talked about post-talk explanations, but now I would like to try to open the black box a little bit and we use communication for it. So the, the, there are two neural networks that communicate with each other. One of them doesn't see the image, but it has an idea of what kind of classes it could contain. And the other one sees the image and is able to understand the questions that the first one is posing. And it needs to, it can't, although it is able to say, this is a dog, we don't allow it to say that. And it, can, it is only allowed to answer the questions that it's asked. The answer is yes in this case, and that eliminates already two of the classes. And then this, this defines the question now, the next question. The question is, does it have whiskers? The answer is no, that eliminates one of the classes. Again, the class, the final class becomes, it's a dog. And this way of um, decision-making is quite transparent. How do we achieve that? We have, a, we have two agents, the blue agent and the red agent. The blue agent is a simple LSTM model that has an augmented memory mechanism that keeps track of the previous question the answers to previous questions. And um, we take the hidden unit activation of an LSTM, of this LSTM, and we um, have an MLP on top of it that chooses the question that um, um, optimizes the communication in terms of in information content. So the question that is going to reveal the most information is going to be chosen. And this question is uh, fed to the, the second agent, the red agent, that looks at the image, extracts features from them, and um, it um, uh, kind of predicts the answers of all of the attributes that is possible, but it is allowed to uh, communicate back only the attribute, the answer of the attribute uh, that is, it is being asked. And in this case, whiskers was no, and then the, the following step is taken. And in this case, the, uh, the model concludes and uh, uh, the, the, this way we infer the class. This way of doing decision, uh, decision making is, um, helps us solve tasks like this. Let's say we have two images um, that could co come from the same class. 
And then the uh, model asks questions like white underparts. Both of these images fall into the same bucket. They both have white underparts. And then um, the, uh, the first model asks these questions, it seems. And at some point, these two images fall into two different buckets. The, the uh, attribute that makes the difference is black wings. The first one doesn't have black wings. The second one does. But this is because, and it's a mistake, this is because the black wings are not visible. So um, we can see where the model has made a um, mistake this way. And the same, um, a similar behavior is observed when two, uh, two images that belong to the same class that look quite different actually, because this is a female bird, this is the male bird. Um, the, although they share the most, um, they share all the fundamental properties that are discriminative. One of them has a black head and this seems to be learned as the class discriminative feature of that class, which is wrong. The model has made a mistake. And because this image doesn't have a black crown, it got classified in, a, in the wrong class. And another task that we worked on along the same lines was visual entailment. Uh, in this case, it is very closely related to visual question answering. But instead of a question, now we have a hypothesis, a sentence that may correspond to the image. And we have an answer whether, so if this image and this image are related to each other, then it's an entailment. Uh, if these two uh, uh, information is contradicting, the answer is contradiction. Otherwise it's neutral. We may not have enough information in either of these information sources to say whether it is, whether these two things are related or not. Um, and so the, um, a, a model that we have developed generates sentences like this to justify why the, this answer is related to these, uh, to, to the hypothesis and the image, the premise. So uh, the image shows a construction site uh, or yeah, um, people standing on a street. And the hypothesis says people are flying kites at the beach and the answer is contradiction. And the model says people cannot be flying kites while they are standing on a street. And this is the ground truth explanation. Finally, um, I haven't really talked so much about attention maps. I touched upon them, but attention maps are uh, important uh, or gradient-based explanations are important, but at the same time, they could be misleading in some cases. So in this work, we were trying to um, uh, narrow down the explanation that is generated uh, by an attention model to um, only the parts of the image that are important for a classification decision. So if we, um, uh, if the, if the model needs to uh, kind of be evaluated for um, weakly supervised object localization, this might not be the best evaluation to evaluate the explanations because we don't necessarily want to localize the entire object, but we want um, the properties that are specific to that class to be highlighted by the model. And this, this was an improvement over CAM, uh, which is capable of doing that. And when we have contrasted explanations like for two different classes, CAM uh, might give the same attention maps, but our model looks at the, uh, the parts that are uh, important for distinguishing between these two different classes. Um, so I find um, uncertainty as, uh, as an important uh, component when it comes to explainability. In this uh, paper, we, uh, we are aiming at another task, but we, uh, we want to use unpaired, we want to do unpaired image to image translation. And um, instead of gen like with a cycle again type of framework, instead of taking an, um, an attention uh, an segmentation mask 
I'm using that as a conditioning variable to generate the image and or, or vice versa. We, um, our model is capable of outputting uncertainty and with um, cascaded refi refinement on the uncertain regions, we can improve the, uh, uh, the output of the model. So um, uncertainty could be cl uh, closely related to, for example, the, in this framework, we say um, the, uh, this image is generated wrongly. The model is able to say that, but uh, the previous models, the, the, the normal cycle GAN is not able to point to which parts of the image co caused this wrong generation. But by uh, outputting uncertainty, we can say that, okay, these are the regions that are not um, that may not be so clear. So those are the regions to be focused on. This reduces the capacity of the network um, and uses the resources to, uh, more um, in a smarter way, basically. Um, so attributes and natural language explanations are, they need to be class specific, image relevant, groundable and contrastive. Those are the four properties that I think are important for an explanation. They uh, can be used to constrain the system for improved interpretability. And uh, so they are an effective means for evaluating the conceptual understanding of the model. So if we want, for example, to communicate our decision to a five-year-old versus a, a grad student, we will choose different language, different uh, way of communicating it. And so far, the models that we have developed don't really do that, but it's important to understand what the user's intentions are when we want to do expl explanations. Okay, as a summary, I talked about in the first part of my talk, and uh, attributes and natural language-based explanations help with the lack of visual data problem for the zero-shot learning problem. And then I mentioned that vision and language complement each other for various tasks. We generated images, we generated features, and then we generated sentences that correspond to a classification decision for a specific image or a video. And then um, I tried to argue that developing explainable deep models is important for users' acceptance. It's, I think, important to think about what a user wants when we generate explanations. Um, maybe in a, in a more general scenario, what we would actually like to do is, um, let's say we are sitting in a self-driving car and the, the car is moving forward. There's nothing interesting going on. So we decide to go to sleep. And then when we woke up, the car has stopped. We would want to know as a user what happened. The model would say, I was driving down an empty road. I decided to slow down as a ball appeared on the right, maybe in, in a court case scenario, or after the car has stopped, the, uh, it communicates with the user and shows this image. I have seen a ball. And then I saw a child running towards the ball, also playback, what happened. So I decided to stop. This is a very, very difficult task to, uh, to realize it, uh, but also it is, in my opinion, very, very important to be able to uh, build models that are capable of doing that. And then when it comes to natural language, there are uh, many other difficulties, like what would have happened if you did not stop? This is a very uh, valid question, which is very difficult to answer. An ideal answer could be, if there was an impact, the child would have gotten hurt, for this simple sentence, the model needs to be able to imagine alternative scenarios and uh, handle uncertainties and also maybe have some form of empathy um, such that it doesn't say the child would, would be broken, but um, they would be hurt. Um, so the language comes, comes with a lot of difficulties um, when it comes to generation, but all, all of these uh, are thing, I think are worth researching about. This is the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, now, if you would like, I'm happy to take questions. Hey, great, thanks for your uh, 
uh, talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, you can also uh, ask questions on the chat board in English or in Korean. In that case, I'll kind of translate that. Any questions? Uh, hello, my name is Hyungjun Ju. And first of all, thank you for a good lecture. Uh, and I have a, one question. Uh, it seems data embedding seems to be important in the combination of image data and semantic data. And mm -hmm. I wonder if it can be used better by disentangling the attribute well by using techniques that disentangle the VAE, such as beta VAE or factor VAE. Yes, yes, this is a very good question. Um, I think um, in, indeed, a, a lot more research went into improving the uh, generative models in the past few years. And um, I believe there have been um, improvements over the, um, over the results I have shown you in, uh, by doing, uh, by improving the generative models, like instead of using a um, vanilla GAN and um, using a Wasserstein GAN or using a, instead of using a vanilla VAE conditional, um, using a beta VAE, all these, um, um, all these improvements indeed make sense for, for these uh, tasks too. Uh, and disentanglement is a very important, um, a very important part of learning the correspondence between an, like a complicated data source images being the complicated data source versus the semantic information. Because, um, so essentially what we are trying to do is um, if, if an image shows certain properties, these attributes, then ideally those attributes should be present in the, um, uh, in the attribute vector too. But because we are using per class attributes, this is not always the case. The image might be showing just the, uh, the head of the bird, but the attributes talk about the, the feet. Then um, the model uh, has gotten noisy data, noisy labels, and this needs to be fixed. And using models like uh, disentanglement, we could perhaps achieve that, yes. Uh, thank you for a good answer. Uh, it helped a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. uh, while we are waiting, uh, I have a just a, a, a kind of a simple question regarding your, uh, I guess it was related to second topic, uh, contrasting mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, Maybe I stopped sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned that you can explain it's better to explain uh, with the ground truth with the contrasting kind of but A, yes. but not B. But there can be many candidate B classes. Uh, how do you choose candidate B class? In that yes, yes, yes. This is a, also a very good question. Um, so this could be determined by the user. Um, the user might be wondering about, uh, so th these two, I know about this other class, why didn't you tell me about this class? And this makes the, the life of the decision maker easier, of course. But also, um, we can um, evaluate these uh, contrastive explanations for many alternative classes. And say, this, uh, this image belongs to this class, of course, if, for example, I'm trying to distinguish between a, a, a cat and a bottle, there aren't so many uh, similarities. And this contrast uh, may not make so much sense. But uh, for, the, for the classes that are visually very related to each other, those are the ones that um, worth kind of contrasting or worth explaining in a contrastive manner. Um, so indeed, um, let's say, I mean, these um, contrastive explanations was like a, a kind of a sidetrack for the, for the papers that I talked about. Um, 
there is no standardized benchmark for evaluating it as far as I, I'm aware. Uh, but when, when somebody decides to create such a ben benchmark, it's important to, to consider this kind of um, situations where the, um, the, the, the model would be required to make a, uh, make a contrast because these two classes are visually very similar to each other. So it might actually make sense to do it for fine grained classification. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any questions from the audience? You can type in your question on the chat board. Uh, maybe I have then one more question. Uh, the, the explanation method that you like proposed today, uh, are they uh, kind of in the category of post hoc methods, methodologies, or? Yes, the, the first um, uh, explanations, these language-based explanations are categorized into post hoc explanations because we, um, we have a decision maker that is independent from the explanation generator. And I often get this question, um, and it, is, it makes a lot of sense, of course, to, 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 to to understand why even post-hoc explanations are interesting. Um, so I don't argue that post-hoc explanations are the best way of doing explanations, but it could be uh, still um, relevant and important. And it may even be um, the only way that, uh, let's say humans, ex explain each other's behaviors. So for example, if I, um, uh, if I raise my hand like this, and then um, I, somebody asks you, why did she do that? You would say, because she wanted to, I don't know, uh, say hi or something. And uh, so you have done that and it is, um, it's accept acceptable because, um, um, because you have detected consistencies in my behaviors. And um, at the same time, you did that without looking, without having the possibility of looking at what exactly, which, which part of my brain got activated to, that led to the, a certain decision. So um, uh, fully transparent explanation mechanisms are not possible in case of humans, at least in, in, uh, in the current um, technology we have. So in that sense, if we want to create models, uh, machine learning models that behave like humans, we may not need um, them to show us exactly how they operated. Um, instead, um, we, we might require them to be consistent in their behaviors. And um, by asking them uh, different types of questions, we can reveal inconsistencies in their behaviors, and then we can, we may choose to trust this system or not. So, I think post hoc explanations are as as important as um, uh, introspective explanations, where we can really investigate, open open the black box, and see what it is doing. Um, yeah, but I kind of. Um, I can't really say I choose, I, I prefer one way or the other at this point. Can it be applied to like inherently uh, explainable like uh, deep learning models or are they kind of uh, very different or unrelated? Um, actually, if, if the decision maker is more transparent, mm -hmm. um, the post hoc explanation generator um, um, gets more information and it has more um, uh, opportunities to create, to generate better explanations. So I think if the uh, decision maker can be made transparent, that would help post-hoc explanations too. Uh, or, or maybe we won't call them post-hoc explanations anymore, but um, the generated sentences, it would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Because this is maybe um, 
uh, what we were trying to do while we were um, um, drawing bounding boxes around body parts or around um, attributes. So uh, we, wa we wanted the decision maker to reveal us more, um, more information, give us more information about where they, where they looked at. And then that helped generate better sentences. Actually, at the end, uh, you uh, kind of raised an important uh, question, like the, the final goal of like, I mean, in the example of like self-driving cars. Yes. Uh, in my mind, it seems that uh, you need some kind of uh, logical reasoning to get that kind of natural language answers. I mean, instead of just using, you know, language-based explanation, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you think some kind of logical reasoning is required to, to do that kind of final, to achieve that kind of final objective? Yes, I think um, a hybrid uh, technique using logic together with deep learning uh, is maybe the way to go in these cases. Um, because logic would help us uh, utilize contextual information better. So um, it's important that so, so to, to be able to answer some of the questions that, um, that user might be posing, uh, we need a lot of contextual information. Like, um, I don't know, that like a child wouldn't be broken, but would be hurt. And we know that because a child is a living being and being hurt is a property of living beings. So, um, um, so all these nuances in the language are, uh, could be encoded with, um, with logic, perhaps. I don't have any, any experience on that, so I, I can't tell based on experience it works, but um, um, my intuition tells me that a hybrid model with classical machine learning techniques and deep learning could be like combining the two could be the, the answer to some of our questions. Okay, thank you for the nice answers. Um, okay, before we <laughs> finally close the, uh, the talk, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, if not, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Professor, uh, for your great talk. It was really uh, interesting. Hope to <laughs> see you maybe offline someday yes. in the future conference. Okay. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again for your invitation. Oh, thanks a lot. Okay, talk to you soon. Have okay. a nice evening. Bye. Bye.